Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por la presencia. Hoy tengo el placer de presentarles al profesor John Rosenberg de la Universidad de Los Ángeles, de Irving. Es profesor en Ciencia Política, pertenece a la Escuela de Ciencia Política de la Universidad y es director del programa de eh, Psicología Política. Sus campos de interés, los temas digamos, que investiga el profesor Rosenberg son bueno, psicología política, democracia deliberativa, ideología, teoría social y eh, desarrollo y psicología social, perdón, este, psicología eh, social y eh, del desarrollo. En, ha sido profesor visitante en eh, la Universidad eh, de Leiden, en eh, los Países Bajos, eh, también en la Universidad de Princeton, eh, en la Universidad de California también, pero eh, en Berkeley, y también eh, ha hecho su eh, programa postdoctoral en el programa de Psicología Política en la Universidad de Yale. Ha publicado eh, recientemente un libro denominado The Not So Common Sense, uh, How People Judge Social and Political Life, es decir, el no tan sentido común, digamos, cómo la, eh, la gente eh, juzga la vida social y política. Este libro fue eh, publicado originalmente en 2002 y luego tiene una reimpresión en 2006, eh, también eh, ha publicado libros sobre eh, razón, ideología y política, eh, razonamiento político y conocimiento, eh, repensando la democracia, la deliberación democrática, los límites y potenciales de la participación ciudadana, eh, también eh, teorizando la psicología política eh, y, eh, por último, eh, en contra de la economía de la economía política neoclásica, una crítica eh, psicológica política. Eh, es miembro de la American Political Science Association y también de la International Society of, of Political Psychology. Eh, bueno, el profesor hoy nos acompaña y su este, presentación va a versar sobre tipos de democracia y los límites de la participación ciudadana. La, la presentación va a ser en inglés, pero obviamente hay traducción. Profesor Rosenberg. Gracias. Antes de empezar, es un gusto para mí estar aquí. Uh, tine, tenía la idea de hablar con, con ustedes en español, perdóname, en castellano, uh, pero tengo un problema, no tengo el vocabulario, y por eso voy a hablar en inglés, perdóname. Pero uh, tengo una PowerPoint que está en español y ojalá que uh, va a uh, ayudarles. Um, ok, to begin. Um, in general, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to start off by looking at deliberative democracy um, as a theory and then as a practice. My approach to this will be somewhat critical. Um, so I begin with a certain skepticism, this is a little loud for me, um, with a certain skepticism, um, but then I, I do not wish to end there because I'm very sympathetic with many of the aims and concerns, and so I wonder what the potential is for deliberative democracy and how it can be realized. In approaching this, I do so partly um, as someone with a serious theoretical interest in deliberative democracy, but also as an empirically oriented political psychologist. So to begin, deliberative democracy begins with a problem, a problem that is understood to pervade uh, modern democracies. Um, and there is a sense that these democracies have very fundamental problems, that democracy in many important ways is a failure. And the, the reference point here typically is electoral democracy. Um, and so when um, students of political science look at uh, political culture, they see a situation, a political situation dominated by alienation of the citizenry, a distrust of politics, 
a tendency not to participate in political life, and a sense on the part of citizens that they have no real power in the communities of which they are a part. Um, on the social side, there is also a concern, in some, t in some sense, in the breakdown of society, a disintegration of society. Um, and as felt by the participants, the members of that society, a loss of community. Um, as political theorists, people who look at most contemporary democracy, view representative democracy as offering the most minimal realization of democratic principles of autonomy and equality, of personal power and equality. Um, and in this context, um, deliberative democracy is offered as a political solution that will solve all of the problems to which I just referred. Um, it is inclusive deliberative democracy because it attempts to involve normal citizens in the making of those policies that will affect them. In this sense, by being inclusive, it builds political community, addresses some of the problems of social disintegration. It involves a broader respect for the autonomy of citizens, for their power, um, because the citizens that do come together get to help set the political agenda, to analyze political problems themselves and begin to generate their solutions. In this sense, it is empowering. It is egalitarian in that citizens are presumed to have an equal voice uh, in this collective activity in which they are engaged and ultimately decide by consensus. And there are various models for this. Uh, the jury system, um, as I'm aware it's practiced in Anglo-American society. Um, also in the United States, we have a number of projects. There is deliberative democratic exercises in the United States. They tend to occur below the observation of most political scientists because they are local and the tendency for political scientists is to focus mostly on national uh, political activity. Um, but when I first began to be interested in deliberative democracy about five or six years ago, um, I was quite interested to discover we did some research um, and there was a deliberative democratic exercise occurring in a town near my university. Um, and we discovered that um, when we started questioning those who were organizing it, that um, 32 different firms, businesses, whose only activity is organizing deliberative democratic practices, had competed for the city contract. Um, and we discovered as of about five or six years ago that over a thousand of these deliberative exercises had been conducted within the United States. Um, all of you will be more aware of these kinds of activities outside of the United States. Um, the question is, what is the presumptions about the nature of this deliberative practice? Um, I am less interested in the particular formal institutional qualities of it, but more in what is supposed to go on within that institutional context, how it is people actually interact with one another in these collective settings. And there are certain assumptions made by deliberative democratic theorists and practitioners. One is that the, the, this will be a site of argumentation. Um, there will be a cooperative presentation of claims, Cooperative in the sense that my claims, the claims being made, are always open to questioning. Um, and in making my claim, I offer reasons, and that opens up something to you that you can interrogate on your part. Um, at the same time, there is respect for the perspective of others. Respect in the sense that I am aware that they may not believe or understand what I do, and I try to express myself in a way that presumes that they may not understand or believe as I do to begin with. And so I will be more elaborate um, in my presentation. I will try to convince people in terms that motivate them, in terms of values that they care about and find some common ground between us. In addition, this interaction is supposed to be characterized, and the Anglo-American literature focuses less on this, but the feminist literature is very useful in this regard. 
is that it's also characterized by an actual care and concern for the interests of others in addition to one's own. Um, and so it's very much also an empathic um, exercise oriented to some notion of the fairness of what is going on among the participants and their common good. So these are some of the basic assumptions made um, by deliberative democratic theorists. It's part of what they assume will go on in this setting. And what are the benefits of deliberation? Um, I've alluded partly to some of this in light of the initial statement of problems, but there are benefits for individuals. Uh, they feel more efficacious. As a result of participating in these activities, the notion is citizens become more broadly empowered. They also have a sense of belonging to a community. The communities tend to be very diverse, abstract, and large. Um, by being involved in a collective activity with strangers rather than with friends or family, one has a means of connecting to that broader community and feeling a sense of it. Um, also, there will be an increased knowledge of relevant social and political issues. And finally, that in some way as a function of participating in these activities, people become more capable social and political actors that their thinking becomes somewhat more complex and sophisticated um, in their understanding both of the situation that they're dealing with and the values that they bring to play. And in engaging other, their communicative capacity, um, their ability to effectively converse with other people increases. There are also collective benefits and advantages. Um, there is commu community building. We live in typically diverse communities, diverse ethnically, religiously, ideologically, and the notion is this provides a, a venue for bridging some of these differences. Um, it also empowers government, um, because insofar as government is a cooperative participant, in these kinds of activities. It increases the legitimacy of whatever policy comes out of it. There is a sense that we helped make this policy and therefore this policy is legitimate and we are more likely to be responsive to it. And finally and importantly, there is a notion that there is a critical potential that develops in the culture at large. So these are all of the claims. Um, made by political theorists and advocates of deliberative democracy. The question which emerges is what really in fact goes on? Um, how is it that people in fact talk to one another? Do they argue with reasons? Do they interrogate each other's reasons? Do they take the perspective of the others that they are with, recognizing their difference and accommodating to that? Um, are they engaging one another in an empathic way? These are all open questions. Um, also, not all discussions are the same. We have some sense of productive discussions or unproductive discussions, but this is a very limited vocabulary for talking about what might occur in deliberative settings. We need a, need a more adequate way of differentiating the different kinds of conversations which may take place there and with that in hand, we can start to think about what the impact of these different kinds of deliberations are in terms of the kinds of citizens the individual participants in those conversations can be. What kind of citizens can they be and what kinds of results will it produce for the collective group itself? Now in my own work, I've tried to begin to differentiate between types of conversation or deliberation. Um, and in so doing, I try to argue that there is a way in which the, inter the communicative interaction between individuals is orchestrated. And I define four types of these structures of communication. 